Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The men and women of the United States Air Force, in keeping with one of the oldest traditions in military service, pay special tribute today to Chief Master Sergeant Curtis E. Miller on the occasion of his retirement after more than 26 years of faithful service to the nation. The presiding official for today's ceremony is the Commander, Air Force Personnel Center, Major General Christopher E. Craig. We would like to thank everyone for joining us today to celebrate the amazing career of an outstanding chief. At this time, we would like to recognize our distinguished guests. The spouse of the providing official, presiding official, Mrs. Penny Craig. Woo! Chief Master Sergeant Miller's wife, Mrs. Jennifer Miller. His children, Chloe, Tristan, Jesse, and James. His daughter-in-law, Savannah, and his grandchildren, Emery, Athena, and Sage. His mother and father-in-law, Mr. Ted and Terry Bruno. His sister, Anita Miller, and fiance, Mark. His nieces, Haley Miller, Morgan Coonan, and Allie Paulson. And his nephew, Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Coonan, and his wife, Diana. We would also wish to extend a special welcome to all commanders, senior enlisted leaders, first sergeants, family, friends, former supervisors, and colleagues who are joining us this afternoon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of the national anthem by Senior Airman Courtney Woods, followed by the invocation by Chief Master Sergeant Lee Hoover. Oh, so can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the Father, we uh, thank you, Lord, for bringing this group of people together to celebrate the Air Force career of our friend, our brother, our father, husband, son, Curtis Miller. Lord, thank you for giving him the courage and discipline and integrity to serve our nation honorably for 26 years. Thank you for giving him the passion and drive to push our team forward. And thank you for giving him wisdom and insight that he poured into so many others including many of us here today. Lord, we also thank you for his family, Jen, James, Tristan, Jesse, and Chloe. Lord, we know of their service and their sacrifice, and we thank you for their resilience and their support as they served alongside Curtis. And lastly, Lord, we pray for continued blessings on the Miller family. 
May you guide them as they transition in this next chapter. And in all things, may you give them peace, prosperity, and joy. Thank you for this day of celebration, Lord. We ask for your blessings on this ceremony. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you, Chief Hoover. Chief Miller would like his ceremony today to be focused on his family. To honor his request, we will not be reading or presenting his retirement medal or the certificates of appreciation. He has received certificates from the President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden, former presidents Donald J. Trump and George W. Bush, Texas Senator Ted Cruz, Governor of Texas Greg Abbott, the Chief of Staff of Air Force General Charles Q. Brown, and the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force Joanne Aspas. All can be viewed on the table by the entrance. I would like to draw your attention to the small table in the right of the stage. It is set for a one. This table is our way of symbolizing the fact that members of our profession of arms are missing from our midst. They are commonly called prisoners of war and missing in action. We call them brothers and sisters. They are unable to be with us this afternoon and so we remember them. This table set for one is small symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against their oppressors. Remember, the tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. Remember, the single red rose displayed in a vase reminds us the families and loved ones of our comrades in arms who keep the faith awaiting their return. Remember, the yellow ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the yellow ribbon worn upon the lapel and breast of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand a proper accounting of our missing. Remember, the candle is lit, symbolizing the upward reach of their unconquerable spirit. Remember, a slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. Remember. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us this afternoon. Remember, the chair. The chair is empty. They are not here. Remember, all of you who served with them and called them comrades, who depended upon their might, aid, and relied upon them, for surely they have not forsaken you. Remember, remember until the day they come home, Remember, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the presiding official for today's ceremony, Major General Craig. All right, let's see. Uh, can you guys hear me in the back? I could probably do this if you hear me in the back as well. <laughs> I'll keep it up as well. Um, hey, first of all, uh, Hope you don't mind I turn off the fan. We're going to sweat no matter what. So let's just get over that right off the bat. Um, we get to hold an outdoor event, which is pretty cool. Now, a few in the back, I think, came here thinking you were getting beer. Uh, it is the old main ice house. So I apologize. The general officer here, you know, you give me the microphone, so you're stuck with me for a little bit, and I get to, I get to brag on this family. Um, I want to thank everybody, first of all, for taking time to come out here and celebrate. Uh, there's nothing more fun than doing a retirement and seeing all the friends and family show up. That's half the battle, right? It's the whole point of getting promoted, retiring, is to have parties. Um, the other thing is setting this up. You know, yes, those who have been to the old main ice house, it kind of looks like this normally, but it does not look like this normally, does it? Um, and I think it's really fitting that you did the PMO, POW MIA. Um, and that, that really, when you talk about the Millers, thinking about other people first. Uh, we start off the ceremony, and what do we do? We don't talk about him. We talk about someone who's not here. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's pretty darn cool. Um, so, again, thanks everybody and welcome. Um, I have to correct the uh, little correction to the script there, though. Uh, I am not Major General Craig. I am Penny's husband. <laughs> Just as this is not Chief Miller, this is Jen's husband. I, I, we, I think we're all pretty clear on that. And that's really the only reason, that's really the only reason we're here. He's interesting, you're more compelling. Um, and, and we'll leave it at that. But, um, but I will say, you know, I look around and I see some friendly faces here, fr uh, you know, kid faces that I saw back in Turkey that were about this tall, that are now this tall. 
uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, we've got four kids, three grandkids, six plus siblings. We got mom and dad, I think, on the line, uh, you know, looking at this, getting recorded. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, other mom and dad here in person. Um, so we have the whole family. And uh, so the, the stuff up here and the protocol is fancy, but let's face it, this is a family affair. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about. Now, my job today is to talk probably a little bit more and, and brag, I'm gonna brag about Curtis. Uh, I'm really talking about the family here. And if I can do anything for the kiddos, I'm just trying to squeak out a little bit of you thinking he's cool. That's my, that's my whole, like, oh, okay, I guess he's a little bit cool on that. Um, so I go through when I do these, and it's really fun, because I get the chance to really brag about, you know, uh, the member retiring. Um, it's always a great honor and privilege, and you asked me, I guess, what, you know, several months ago uh, to do this. Y you probably didn't ask me. It was probably Jen asking Penny, um, and that's how that, that's how my, I have no friends other than Penny's friends. But, um, but that's how it works, and when you get that type of uh, a request, there's never a, a pause, like, yeah, I don't know if I want to do this. It's like, wow, I, I can't believe someone wants me to come and talk about them in their career. Uh, so it really is, it's really an honor. So thank you for letting me do that. Uh, and then it's fun, because I get to dig through all the records. Hey, for those in the military, I work at AFPC, I get to see all the records. Um, I dig through all the records, and then I pull some things out, and I'll highlight a, a few of those. Um, and I'll tell you this, we always start with why, right? So, you know, why are we here in the first place? Why am I standing? And why is the sun coming out now for those who are out of the city? Um, but, but the reason for why uh, comes back to growing up in a small town. So I think uh, you, you grew up in a town of about, I think I'd written down here 237 in Clarington, Ohio. Uh, so small town, um, there's certainly a sense of service in that Midwest uh, environment. Um, and then at the time, it was also, you had a, you'd start a family, and it was time to, as I talked to Curtis about, hey, it was time to, to go do something. And that's the theme I think you're gonna see with Curtis uh, that we've all known and worked with him is the fact that you've got a guy that, at the end of the day, there's a lot of service, sacrifice, and leadership, but quite candidly, when I think of Curtis, I think about someone who's gonna get the job done uh, and wants to make not just the unit better, but the people around him better, and that's the theme that comes out across the board uh, for you. Um, get done with, uh, well, you get done with high school, and uh, it's time to take care of the family. In 95, you head off to basic military training. Uh, you're done with training, you do really well, to the point you get head up to Lackland, go to tech training school in this Biomed tech, uh, which I you know don't know what that means other than you scored pretty well on your ASVAB. Uh, is what it comes down to. And uh, you know he goes off and uh, does a great job of tech training. Gets assigned from '96 to '99. Heads out to Travis Air Force Base in, Cal in uh, California. As you go through, he's doing biomed. He's a rapid technician. Um, you know his tech knowledge in high demand. But what I like to do is go and see those first reports. What's written there? Because a lot of times, whether you retire as a, a chief, master sergeant, those very first, you know, young airmen, OPRs, or EPRs say it all. And here's what, I, here's what I picked up. Quote, high degree of concern for patients and staff. And, you know, I think about that. Hey, I'm expecting that in the medical career field. Doctors, nurses, frontline care. Um, you're doing the med tech, and that's what they're writing about. Which tells me, man, you're, you're doing more uh, right off the bat than is expected of you. And then this was pretty cool. Team player on and off duty. Um, and I think that's in many ways why a lot of folks are here today, right? Because uh, you are a team player, both at work, but also behind the scenes and off duty as well. Uh, but performance is no exception. Top biomed engineer for 97. Um, he goes from A1C up to senior airman. Uh, I noticed he was fixing, adjusting, and constructing things. I mean, no kidding, I'm reading something from this uh, EPR where you constructed a repair kit for a medical piece of equipment. I just don't see senior airman like constructing things. That I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and you were acting as a NCOIC at that young age already. Uh, so a 99 time frame already stepping up. That's a Travis. So he moves on from there because what do we do with our best performers? A lot of times we send them to go be teachers. We send them to go be instructors. So he heads back to Shepherd Air Force Base for, uh, for tech training school. So we, again, becomes an instructor. Uh, it says, you know, a role model. I find that questionable. <laughs> um, but I'm not trying to make a big deal here. Um, ALS, so Airman Leadership School, top of his class on that. He gets top of vowels as an instructor, quote, sharp and professional. Again, it was earlier career, so I have a few questions on that. But it was written, it was written in A, sharp and professional. Whatever, I guess we'll go with it. Uh, he becomes an NCO there, and uh, he's off doing uh, his uh, community college in the Air Force, uh, involved in mentor programs working multiple squadrons. And remember, he's at Shepard, 
from 99 to 2008. So this is a big, really formative time for you, I think, and really the journey of making that move from being a young airman into the NCO ranks and all the leadership. You're doing stuff on and off, Boy Scouts, schools, um, but I saw at the end of the day, epitome of an NCO, which I thought was pretty cool. And it's towards the end of this time frame um, that you get the nod and you get the tap to head towards Afghanistan. Um, if we think about that time frame, folks, 2006, 7, 8, uh, we're in the heart of the envelope, right, of really have to get after it uh, in Afghanistan and really leaning in. And it wasn't a question of, of, hey, should I go? It's like, yep, I'm absolutely going. I can see in his training reports, you know, the combat lifesaver uh, skills, uh, the combat skills that you're going to, all the courses uh, where you're knocking it out of the park uh, because you're leaning into Remember I talked up front about can do, get her done. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing. And you really leaned into that, which I, I think was uh, especially uh, impressive. Enduring freedom, you're there, Kabul, Kandahar, you're all over. Uh, you're embedded in the first ID. Um, this is the part where, okay, kids, yeah, your dad was a little bit cool. We got it. We have to do it. Um, but I, and I'm not going to go into your details, but you should ask him um, a little bit about that. He embedded with the Afghan National Army, uh, mentoring an Afghan National Army 06, working all their medical uh, capabilities at that point uh, to move on. 200 plus convoys. The convoys, of course, is what catches my ear because then I remember a conversation I had with the woman of the hour, Miss Jen, talking about, hey, most importantly, what do you do in Afghanistan? You met Jen, right? And, uh, and it has some, you have to ask this story because I remember it vaguely. But it had something to do with a manual transmission, big rig truck, uh, and something going on there. Like someone could drive, someone couldn't drive. I, I don't know. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, <laughs> But, you know, through, through adversity comes great things. And uh, so really, but, and I'll tell you for this audience here, just pausing momentarily, and, and I know it's hot, so I, I am wasting a little bit of your time here, but, you know, a lot's been going on with Afghanistan uh, and a lot of reflection for us as a nation. And, and I have all my deep thoughts on it for those of us who have served in that, in that neck of the woods. Uh, but I'll tell you, we should be very proud of what we did over there. Uh, and there's a lot of very good things that, that, that occurred let alone the fact that when you're talking about medical support, that endures. Forget about the regimes, forget about the power structures, the, the commitments and the things you made better for that nation are still better. Uh, it's just in a different dynamic, a different atmosphere. And I'd love to talk to you guys more about that. But again, folks should be very proud about what we did uh, in Afghanistan. Okay, so uh, you get done with that 2008, 2011 timeframe, you head to Wright-Patterson. Uh, you become a master sergeant there. Uh, so now you're up in those senior NCO ranks, you're really taking on the role of NCOIC. Uh, med support squadron, um, you're still touching your toes in the water going back. 386 AEW I saw in there, so you're heading to the expeditionary world uh, because now you're a guy who gets things done. You know the joint environment, you know the ops environment, uh, and all that. And at the end of the day, you know, I literally saw in your reports made things and the people around him better. Uh, so again, senior NCO of, uh, of the quarter, senior NCO of, uh, of the uh, deployment, uh, Operation New Dawn, and he's working at a med group level as an NCOIC. So now this is the time that uh, things pivot and we come across paths here because from that location in Wright Pat, you head to Insulik, Turkey, um, where I had the great fortune to, to command the unit out there uh, and get to know. Again, more importantly, I had somebody working in my front office named Jen um, that I got to know. So when I first met you, I didn't really know who you were other than you were Jan's husband. Um, and your rank probably didn't matter at, at that point. Um, but you know, before I forget, I will have to tell this story and it's buried somewhere in my, like many of you guys, I've got like six boxes in the basement I haven't even opened yet. Uh, and I've been here for over a year, sad but true. And in one of those, um, the best thing I can describe, Curtis, you know, Curtis calls it like it is, let's face it, right? Uh, didn't care whether you're a wing commander, doesn't care whether you're a two-star general, he's gonna tell you how it is. And of course, isn't that what we need? Isn't that what we need out of our senior NCOs? And uh, so I've got a great photo and those in the Insulik crowd, which, you know, we have a bunch of Insulik friends here right now. Um, I've got a photo from a Christmas session where we were passing out. His Christmas present for the white elephant was uh, a photo uh, that I ended up receiving, and I think there's a plant. So I still have it to this day. It's a photo of General Breedlove, who was the USAFE commander at the time, and Curtis Miller. And it's signed photo, uh, which is pretty cool that you would give that up. You know, just yeah. to have General Breedlove's signature uh, on, oh wait a minute, it wasn't General Breedlove's signature on it. It was Curtis's signature. <laughs> so he gets me a photo with him shaking the USAFE commander's hand with his signature on it. I'm like, thanks Curtis, I, I really appreciate that. I, I thought that was great. But that, that, that sums up a lot. Uh, not afraid, it's awesome. Um, hey, there was a lot going on at, at Insulik, and I'm looking across here, and I can see all sorts of Insulik crowd here. Um, Insulik, as I will, would say in the past, a lot, lots going on there. While we were there, the Syrian Civil War kicked off. 
Uh, we brought in Patriot batteries. We had Preds there coming in. Um, our hospital and the administration of that went way beyond uh, a clinic or a hospital. Uh, the engagement at the Turkish national level, uh, the fact of trying to coordinate downtown, and then the service and the care for a joint environment that was coming there uh, was, was necessarily, and I'd say all joking aside now, um, and this is again for the kids, your dad was kind of cool, uh, he ends up becoming number one over 100 plus master sergeants there uh, at the time. This is not the wing commander speaking, this is the command chief who's in the audience here, Chief Judge, saying, yeah, this guy's good, uh, and we need, to, we need to take him to the next level. Uh, he becomes our wing senior NCO of the year, and I gotta tell you, in that environment, to stand out like that, meant not that he was seeing the right people, it was he was doing the right thing by the people around him. Uh, and you know all those out there, you don't get those positions and those titles without your peers and your subordinates thinking it's pretty cool. Um, so, and again, thanks for all the work you did over there. And, uh, and all joking aside, I truly appreciate everything you did and, and all of our successes because of uh, you're making us better. Um, you get done with that 2013, 2018 time frame, you head back to Langley. Um, and now you're, you know, very much on track to, to go rapidly in the senior NCO ranks. Senior Master Sergeant shortly after that. Um, I can go through the list of exercise evaluation teams and president of top three and function, MASHCOM functional managers, all those key buzzwords. Um, but then I come across this, and it's in the report. Quote, one of two Air Force medics to the White House on Ebola mission brief. Really? I mean, you know, POTUS, President of the United States. It's an acronym that we use, but you don't really often see it. it you know, and I think at the time you were maybe senior ma master, senior master sergeant. So I was talking to Curtis about that. That's one story you probably need to talk to him about. But yeah, during Langley, that expertise comes into full swing for his medical expertise, deploying not just to Africa uh, and Liberia with, uh, with Ebola, but also later on to uh, Puerto Rico, parts down south for, uh, for hurricane uh, relief as well. Uh, and then so much so that he got lauded and sent up to the White House to report in and, and, uh, and brief up the president on the efforts uh, going on. So so pretty cool on that. Wing NCO of the year, remember, it wasn't just Insulik, he's doing that all over the place. Um, and then just lots of words. And this is where he gets selected for, uh, for Chief Master Sergeant. So again, kiddos, I've used words like combat, I've used words like president, so at least a couple things out there you can tease out when you talk to him later. Um, hey, I'm conscious of our time. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to a lot of you uh, when we get done with this break, uh, when we actually do grab the beers and, and start celebrating even more. Um, it's wonderful to be out here. I'll, I'll wrap up by saying, you know, in 2018, 19, he headed out, probably the last thing I'll say is he headed out to Travis Air Force Base. And I saw at the time when I talked to Curtis, this is when all the fires are going on out in California. Uh, serves uh, notably, so notably that he gets the phone call from the Chiefs group going, hey, I know you've been there for probably, what, six, seven months but we need you down in San Antonio. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's not one of those, yeah, you, exactly, that, that cringeworthy, what, say that again? No, no, we, we just unpacked. Uh, and uh, when I talked to him about that, and this is a true testament of a, of a leader uh, and a servant, is he didn't sit there and say, nope, can't do it, I'm out, I'm done. He said, okay, Roger, I'm heading on down. And, uh, and then arrived here in 2019, uh, to the Joint uh, Base San Antonio, Sam Houston uh, Arena. Um, I've been greatly impressed by the programs down there. I know we have a lot of folks helping out. Uh, what you do for our joint force uh, to get folks up for medically trained, which again, uh, in value and in demand, uh, is impressive. Uh, all your pushes on your state.
I'd also like to point out the unbelievably talented mentors I've had, like Master Sergeant James Harris, who's in the crowd here with me today, and Senior Master Sergeant Shane Brown, uh, who's out in the digital world watching. They not only saw my potential, but they pushed me beyond what I thought I could achieve. It wasn't always pleasant, but love doesn't always feel like a hug. They instilled in me that the truth, even if uncomfortable, should never be forsaken. They taught me that integrity is consistency of character, and if you ever display, displace your character for the sake of reputation, you have no integrity. They taught me that integrity lost is gone forever. They taught me about care, love, and compassion. They taught me that honesty without compassion is brutality. They taught me to master my trade, and if I only had the depth to do one thing, I should do my job. I'm forever grateful. Thank you so much. The little human beings I raised, James, Tristan, Jesse, Chloe, you're always my purpose. You have been there with me through all the ups and downs. You have given me an immense amount of joy. Your resilience and sacrifice have made me an extremely proud father, and I could never thank you enough. I love all of you. Ted and Terry, I will never forget going to meet you for the first time by myself. Um, I went and met Ted and Terry, having never met them without Jen. Um, and I happened to be going TDY through Pensacola, so I stopped and I stayed with them and I asked Ted for his blessing, as I'd hoped to ask his daughter to marry me. And uh, of course he said, hey, I'll give you your blessing, but don't bring her back. <laughs> um, and I kept, I kept that promise thus far, but the day's young, Ted. Um, but what I would like to do is, is to give you a gift to express um, the love I have for y'all, and the thanks for all you've given in supporting Jen and I. I got my amazing nephew here with me today, Ryan, who's a Army Staff Sergeant, and I'm extremely proud of him. Um, although most of our, my, my sister Anita was an airman, um, my sister Patty was an airman. My brother Joe was a goof off and a soldier. Um, my brother Will, he liked to party, so he didn't join the team. But um, extremely proud as I see Ryan grow and become a staff sergeant in the world's greatest army, become a soldier in the world's greatest army. Um, and I say that to say I've spent six years of my career working for the army, never being a soldier but always playing one on TV, right? Um, and six years, above all the lessons I learned, and I got some of my friends like Master Arm Retired Leech in the back there. Hey Mark, how are you doing? Um, a lot of these mentors that I had that were, were soldiers, all the old Sergeant Major and Warrant Officers that taught me as a, a, as a young NCO, they taught me a lot of things, but one fact stands out one thing that I learned working with the Army above all else is it's better to be in the Air Force. <laughs> cross into the blue, cross into the blue, right? Um, I'd be remiss not to share a story about my time embedded with the 1st Infantry Division uh, in Afghanistan. I spent 13 months, um, eight, eight weeks training, 13 months deployed with the 1st Infantry Division. So I was on a small compound called Camp Eggers in Kabul. Um, and the story I want to share is not, not, not a story about the war, which I have tons of great war stories and none of them are true, but, um, <laughs> but it's a story about a girl. Uh, I was the mayor of this small camp. I had it on lockdown, right? Um, anybody that knows me knows this is true. I'm very charismatic, which is often contrary to good order and discipline which is what the book that we study says. Um, 
So I was the mayor, I had it on lockdown. I would give school on dominoes and spades almost every night down by a fire pit by the Green Bean Coffee House, which was the hangout. Um, so every night that I wasn't forward deployed, I was, I was in the front of that Green Bean. One evening, I looked up and there was the prettiest girl I ever saw. She was wearing a desert tan flight suit and had long, beautiful blonde hair. So I'm with the Army. I do what I got to do. I immediately call dibs. <laughs> right? um, and I approach the angel in desert tan. Every smooth line and suave moment, sir, in my entire life culminated into the instance of extreme charm that I was about to lay down. <laughs> I looked into those gorgeous blue eyes, the windows of her soul, and made a statement which, that was surely going to light her fire. I looked at her and I said, Sup? <laughs> <laughs> Smooth like peanut butter, right? Yeah. I knew at that very second that she was the boo. Um, she looked back at me and, and after I responded, and, and, and when she looked back at me, I knew with what she said next that it was going to be the last first drink I ever bought because she looked at me back into my eyes and she said, so. <laughs> That interaction right there, that was, the <laughs> that was the alpha and the omega that brought us to where we are today. I married my best friend almost three years from that exact day. From the time I saw you in that desert tan flight suit, I have never doubted that you were my forever. You continually put your career behind mine, and I'm forever grateful for all you've sacrificed. I'm excited for us to spoil our grandbabies. I can't wait to start this next chapter and explore the world with you. I love you so much. Blast. <laughs> hey, so one thing I did, me and Jim decided to move um, outside the United States to Texas. <laughs> Which, if you ask my friend, Steve Dad in the back, it's the greatest country in the world and the best state in the union. Oh. So, to show my appreciation, I asked the Texas House of Representatives to fly a Texas flag over the Capitol. And I'm going to have, I'm not going to give it to you, Boo, but it's up here for you, alright? <laughs> that I will always be your chief and I will never be further than a phone call away. Thank you again for being here and God bless you all. The men and women of the United States Air Force are proud to have served with you, Chief Master Miller. We wish you success in your future endeavors. Following a brief photo session, Major General Krug will lead us through a receiving line as we congratulate Chief Master Sergeant Miller and his family. They've invited everyone to stay for the reception, and as always, we conclude ceremonies with the playing of the Air Force song. Off we go. Off we go.